In the summer of 2020, when everyone normal was concerned with all the constant threats of apocalypse, Joanne Kathleen Rowling was busy writing a blog, which would later get called an essay and celebrated by the BBC. Despite it rather quickly being shown to be brimming with half-truths, sweeping generalisations and, well, let's just call it what it is, shall we? Misinformation. Now, I'm not going to be breaking down Joanne's diatribe today. Plenty of other and better YouTubers and writers have already done that. But the thing is, 2020 was also the year in which I was diagnosed as autistic. And so there's a couple of parts of Joanne's blog which stood out to me in particular. Most people probably aren't aware. I certainly wasn't until I started researching this issue properly. That 10 years ago, the majority of people wanting to transition to the opposite sex were male. That ratio has now reversed. Autistic girls are hugely overrepresented in their numbers. It's a weird thing to just throw in there, isn't it? She doesn't really elaborate either, it's just tossed in there, like... But then you know that thing when you learn a new word and then suddenly you hear it everywhere? The frequency illusion. I kept seeing it everywhere from gender criticals. Although back then I think they were still calling themselves TERFs back before they decided that was a slur, but I don't know. But I did, I kept seeing it all over, all these mentions of autism or possible, potential, suspected autism in gender critical posts and comments. So what's going on here then? What are they talking about me for? But right, the thing is, one of the first things I learnt about the autistic population is that they're more likely to be trans than the general population. And there is statistical evidence backing this up, as well as all the anecdotal evidence you get if you spend more than five minutes following autistic Twitter. So what's all this then? Does this mean that the gender criticals have one single solitary point in amongst all the nonsense? No, of course not. What do you think this is? No. In this video essay, I will show why gender criticals are wrong about everything. So a pretty large sample of trans people were given autism assessments and this showed that 14% of the people in that group showed enough autistic traits to warrant a diagnosis. So if we consider that only an estimated 1% of the general population is autistic, that's significant. But as much as I love a good statistic, and I do, we do have to be careful with them. And there are a few things to keep in mind about this 14 versus 1% thing. So number one, the autistic population is likely to be a lot higher than 1%. We already know about the many, many obstacles in the way of people getting assessed, diagnosed and accepted. And it is widely understood that there are whole generations of autistic people that have been either misdiagnosed or ignored. Two, you will hear some gender criticals claim that most trans people are autistic, but I hope I don't need a whole section of this video to explain why 14% does not constitute most. Three, we should be asking whether this statistic shows that autistic people are more likely to be trans and vice versa, or whether they are more likely to be openly 
trans. More on that later. Four, this is obviously a fairly new area of study, so all statistics should be taken with a grain of contextual salt. But how are these statistics being used and abused by the gender criticals? By the way, if you got this far in and you're still wondering what a gender critical is, you might want to go back and watch my other video um, available somewhere. So for a little bit, I'm going to somewhat steel man the position from gender criticals, and I'm going to do this to show why even the best possible faith interpretations of their positions are still wrong. Most people probably should not do this. They are not coming in good faith. And so arguing with them at face value is probably always going to be a waste of your time. But on the other hand, we can't let these claims go completely unaddressed. Someone has to counter them, sometimes. I'm doing this so you don't have to. There are a number of often contradictory claims being made by gender criticals, and to illustrate some of the points that some of them make, we can turn to the Twitter account of full-time, professional main character, Frances Wheatman. After she mentioned the link between autistic and trans people one day, autistic people were questioning our Francis about why, and this is what she had to say in response. I think people who have black and white thinking and cling to rigid social rules are more likely to be hoodwinked by people who want to do them harm. Does that not bother you? People who cling to rules are more likely to buy into ideologies that enforce them. Gender is one example of this. It reinforces gender norms. This is actually what many gender criticals say about all trans people, by the way. Whenever you hear them say, Trans people are just embodying stereotypes. That's what they mean. They think that trans people are just going, Well, I like blue and hate dresses. Guess I must be a bloke. Which is offensively and nonsensically wrong. But this is position number one. We autistics love a rule, and gender stereotypes are like rules, so... The second position that gender criticals usually take is also helpfully on display in the same tweet. So everyone, say thank you to Francis for making this easy. We're more likely to be hoodwinked, you see. Do you like the word hoodwinked? The argument here is that autistic people might be particularly easy to manipulate or brainwash. And the third reason why gender criticals won't shut up about autism can be understood via this thread by a mother of an autistic man. She says her son is 20 years old at the time of posting and that having an autistic son means there isn't much she doesn't know about autism. Which, um... Yeah, autistic people are reading this like... The thread starts. I just stumbled into the rat hole that is autism and gender identity, and I seriously feel ill. I am the mother of an autistic son who's 20. There really isn't much I don't know about autism. So reading this stuff about autistic kids just signals so many red flags. It then goes on to describe her son's puberty. Uh, difficulty with things like growing hair and other deeply personal details which I don't feel comfortable repeating here. Don't worry though, she assures us that she never made him feel uncomfortable. It's her pinned tweet. She goes on to talk about how puberty can be especially tough for autistic kids and honestly that's true. She says, just when you got used to navigating the world as a kid, boom! Here comes the complexities of puberty. Yes, absolutely. That is an issue. And it's not just about bodies changing either, but social expectations changing too. The way you're treated socially changes. School suddenly gets a whole lot more complicated. And there are so many more pressures placed on you. But the meat of the thread and the main point being made here is that autistic kids have sensory processing issues and they might wrongly conflate this with being trans. 
either due to discomfort in one's own skin or due to a preference for clothing and interests. So now imagine you're mistaking the boy who just prefers to wear more girl-oriented clothing as him really wanting to be a girl. He's autistic. He's not seeing the gender stereotypes of girls and boys. He's probably generally just more comfortable wearing dresses. So here we have the three main reasons given by gender criticals as to why there are so many autistic trans people and why we should be concerned. One. Autistic people cling to rules and so will rigidly adhere to gender stereotypes. 2. Autistic people are more easily manipulated and brainwashed. And 3. Autistic people might confuse sensory aversions with being trans. Obviously, we have an overarching theme here. They're not really trans. These autistics just don't know their own minds. So to discuss these thoughts, in the best faith that I can possibly muster, I'll first look at the statistical evidence, I'll then give my two cents as an autistic person, and then finally we will hear from autistic trans people themselves. The reason why I put the statistical evidence first is, well, number one, it's fairly damning and undermines the GC positions quite nicely, thank you very much. And secondly, I don't want to get a load of the plural of anecdotes isn't data comments from people who haven't watched the whole thing. So the authors of this report, Gender Identity Differences in Autistic Adults, Associations with Perceptual and Sociocognitive Profiles, set out to investigate the claim that autistic traits might somehow create the illusion of a trans identity. So the author's position is that if we are to think that certain autistic traits are creating an illusion of a trans identity, then we would expect to find elevated rates of these traits within the trans autistic population. Whereas if we're to think that autism might just facilitate one in realizing their identity as trans and then coming out as trans, then we would just see high numbers of autistic trans people, which we do. So they looked at data on trans autistic people, cis autistic people, and holistic trans people to see if they could find evidence of autistic traits causing an illusion of transness. You will know if you watched my most recent video on autism that not all autistic people have sensory processing issues. Many do. I do. But sensory processing issues is neither sufficient nor necessary for a diagnosis of autism. So if sensory processing issues were leading to autistic people mistaking themselves for trans, then we would see elevated rates of sensory processing issues among the trans autistic population. However, the data here shows that trans and non-binary autistic people scored slightly lower than cis autistic people when it came to having heightened sensitivities. Trans autistics seem to be generally less sensitive than cis autistics. Next, if we are to accept that autistic people are confusing just liking things that are traditionally for another gender with being trans. If we are to believe that autistic people are clinging to gender stereotypes in this way, then this too should be observable. The researchers did not find significantly elevated rates of dichotomous thinking or any other autistic traits among autistic trans people compared to cis autistic people. But what they did find was extremely elevated rates of non-binary identities among the autistic trans group compared to the holistic trans group. In fact, only 6% of the autistic trans group identified as binary. Non-binary identities are extremely elevated among the autistic population. So how does that fit in with the idea that autistic people are more likely to cling to gender stereotypes? Well, it very obviously does not, does it? Autistic people are far more likely to completely reject the gender binary and all that goes with it. 
but the paper does not comment on the idea that autistic people might be more easily manipulated though, so let's talk about that. First though, just to be completely clear, learning about trans people, learning about how gender doesn't need to be this fixed and immutable thing, feeling the freedom to explore yourself and change yourself to make you happy. This is not a harmful and dangerous ideology, as gender criticals claim. I personally call it fun, cool, and good, actually. But I'm doing the bestest of good faith, so let's take the claim autistic people are more likely to be manipulated into harmful spaces. Let's take that at face value. There is statistical evidence that autistic people might be more likely to fall prey to things like MLMs, cults, membership of extreme organisations, fundamental religions, things like that. As Dr Devon Price notes in his book Unmasking Autism, there are actually a lot of autistic gender criticals out there. But the reasons for this are the same reasons why other groups might be targets for bad actors. Socioeconomic positions in society and loneliness. Scammers and abusers will look for people who maybe have a low socioeconomic standing, who need money or help or support that they aren't getting, and who are yearning for a sense of community and belonging. Just like single moms, military spouses, otherwise disabled people, those who have estranged families, elderly people, and other groups are common targets for things like MLMs and cults. But autistic people are also more likely to be a part of many, many different types of subculture. People who struggle to find friendship, acceptance, and comfort in their immediate environment will seek it out, and they might well find it in dodgy, harmful, or extremist places. But they are much more likely to find it in harmless and fun places. Places like fandom groups, gaming circles, things like Comic-Con, alternative lifestyle groups, coding conventions, specific interest message boards, and autistic social media. Early internet message boards and forums were not only full of autistic people uh, sharing knowledge and work and forming bonds and friendships, but in many cases those early parts of the internet were created by autistic people. There are so many ways that lonely autistic people can find community. Would we say that autistic people are being manipulated into dressing up like their fave sci-fi characters? Of course not. Yes, autistic people are more likely to be lonely, isolated, underemployed, on low incomes, just as multiple other groups of people are too. And the thing we do to prevent those people falling prey to bad actors who would take advantage of them is to accept them support them, and take away the isolation and desperation which bad actors might seek to exploit. Would we talk about women as being easily manipulated and weak-willed just because they represent the vast majority of MLM victims? Gender criticals might, actually. See my video on why gender critical means nothing but biological essentialist. If social isolation leads to many different kinds of people becoming targets for bad actors, then the thing we do is target social isolation. If economic insecurity is leading people down dangerous paths to make money and find security, then the thing we address is economic insecurity. And again, learning about gender as well as sex fostering an open and accepting environment in which people can be themselves. This isn't harm. But maybe autistics are different. Maybe we are just more inclined to be manipulated against our own will. So one of my guilty pleasures is lurking in autism parent Facebook groups. 
Okay, so like I'm in a few and some of them are supposed to be autistic centered. So like you get uh, parents of autistic children asking questions about their kid and then you get autistic people answering the questions, right? Great stuff. I must say though, one of the most common types of posts is basically, why does my autistic child refuse to do stuff? And then you've got like hundreds of autistic people going, because they don't want to. Why are you trying to make them? I'm being glib, but my point here is that words like rigid, defiant, unresponsive to social pressures, in their own worlds, needs repetition and familiarity, and stubborn. These words are more commonly associated with autistic people than will do anything they're told, super malleable. <laughs> and autistic kids are often even misdiagnosed with things like oppositional defiant disorder. Where are you getting the idea that we are easy to manipulate against our own will from that? In fact, anecdotal evidence from therapists and patients suggests that autistic people are actually less susceptible to hypnosis than the general population. Like, uh, ResearchGate has whole threads of therapists expressing their frustrations at being unable to hypnotise their autistic patients. Studies also show that we are much less susceptible to social pressure, and we will behave the same with or without observation, much unlike neurotypicals. But Mika, I'm sure you're shouting, didn't you literally say in your recent video about autism that you're an easy person to lie to? I have been easily conned and manipulated for years. I'm an easy person to lie to and I am absolutely rubbish at lying myself. Ooh, I've been rumbled. You got me. Imaginary person that I wrote into my own script. I am and have historically been an easy person to lie to. And I know that many autistic people out there will relate with how in the moment we can be slow at picking up on contextual cues which might alert us to dishonesty or danger. And I do like to think the best of people, to treat others as I would be treated myself and I can adhere pretty rigidly to this principle. But I know that this is a risk. I know that there are people out there who would take advantage of that. From experience, I know this. But I will still treat the next person I meet the same. I know that sometimes I can miss things or I can be slow at picking up on the underlying stuff. So many times have I had that moment of like, oh, that's what they meant like several days later, <laughs> or realised that the compliment was actually a sarcastic insult. But you know what? I'd like to know why these people who seem so concerned with autistic kids being manipulated, why are they not bothered about the fact that autistic kids all over the world are actually being trained to behave in ways that are against their own will or needs. Kids who are being conditioned to do whatever a stranger tells them or risk pain and distress for multiple hours every day from as early an age as possible. Because that's actually how much effort it takes to make autistic people do stuff they don't want to, by the way. If you're autistic, you might have guessed that I'm talking about ABA, or Applied Behaviour Analysis, which, despite much controversy, is still the only funded treatment for autism in many places. ABA is behavioural training which has the exact same roots as gay conversion therapy. Oh right, yeah, no. I'm starting to see why the GCs aren't mad about it. When autistic adults who had received ABA therapy as kids were polled, 46% of them reported having PTSD due to their experiences. Not just, I didn't like it, but had been diagnosed with a debilitating trauma disorder at the direct result of this treatment. 
and a common complaint was that going through ABA made autistic people less able to advocate for themselves or say no to things that they don't want to do. Joe Ram, who was a board certified behaviour analyst for over 10 years, wrote about their feelings about the profession and on consent and autonomy said this. We give them terrible coping techniques like asking them not to show their feelings and to eat their feelings or suppress them with pieces of candy. This also reinforces to the child that their dissent, choice in how they learn, consent and voice don't matter. ABA teaches autistic children to shut up and fall in line. Teaching obedience without question is, frankly, terrifying especially since teaching blanket compliance to authority grooms people with developmental disabilities to be even more likely to be taken advantage of, abused and bullied. ABA therapy has also just coerced them into silencing their internal and external no. We are talking about young, vulnerable children being trained with reward and punishment techniques to blindly do what they are told by strangers no matter how it makes them feel. And this is something which is advised by doctors as soon as an autistic child gets diagnosed. It's a huge industry, and while practitioners will claim that it's not as bad as it used to be, <laughs> back when they would quite literally torture children into cooperating, it still uses harmful, outdated, and pseudoscientific techniques. Methods such as withholding comfort and kindness from vulnerable children until they comply. So if you want to get mad about autistic kids being manipulated and brainwashed in order to enrich the medical industrial complex, then it's right there. Always has been. We've been talking about it for some time now, but no, of course they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about anything except trans people openly existing. Look at this. A sexist and stereotyping movement that is selling a utopia to autistic and gay kids that leaves them sterilised in the process. Equivocation on the sterilisation of gay and autistic children. Can't believe I'd reduce myself to caring about gay and autistic children being sterilised. It is admittedly difficult when autistic and gay kids are being sterilised. In the meantime, the mass sterilisation of autistic and gay kids is more important. Stand against the severe damage being done to gay and autistic kids. Obsessed? with gay autistic kids getting sterilised, which uh, that's not a thing. Kids are not being sterilised with puberty blockers, that's not happening, that's what we call a lie. However, autistic and queer people have historically been and are being sterilised for being autistic and queer. 30 of the 50 United States of America still allow for forced sterilization of disabled people and of course disabled people of colour are much more likely to be subjected to this. Historically, forced sterilization of anyone with developmental disabilities was seen as best practice by mainstream medicine. Across the world, intersex people are still being sterilized without their consent often as babies. And of course, anti-trans legislation in way too many countries demands that trans adults undergo sterilisation before they are permitted to access gender-affirming care. You also have millions of impoverished people out there being forcibly sterilised all the time just for being poor. Where's the rage, Francis? Where's all the tweets? They don't care. Because they're liars and liars care not for hypocrisy. To survive in this world as an autistic person, you need to have strength, determination, and audacity. You need to adapt your identity in order to fit in with a cookie cutter version of normal, while at the same time, carving out your own space in this world to be yourself in peace, which is a necessity for survival. To put up with the constant humiliation, alienation, loneliness and judgement and still find joy in your autistic nature and interests? If you can do that, if you 
are doing that, then you are showing the strength and determination that all marginalized people have to exhibit in order to survive in a hostile and dangerous world. To then be called weak-willed, easily led, not quite as autonomous as others. To hear that and not immediately punch whoever said it directly in the face? Well, that's just another example of how strong-willed you are. In a moment, we're going to hear from the wonderful autistic trans people who responded to my thread on Twitter. Thank you so much to everyone who shared their experiences. But first, I want to talk about me and what I think, because I'm a YouTuber, so of course I do. Going back to that stuff that JK wrote, at one point she muses that perhaps she might have wanted to transition in order to escape womanhood, writing, The more of their accounts of gender dysphoria I've read, with their insightful descriptions of anxiety, dissociation, eating disorders, self-harm and self-hatred, the more I've wondered whether, if I'd been born 30 years later, I too might have tried to transition. The allure of escaping womanhood would have been huge. I struggled with severe OCD as a teenager. If I'd found community and sympathy online that I couldn't find in my immediate environment, I believe I could have been persuaded to turn myself into the son my father had openly said he'd have preferred. As others have pointed out, being trans is not anxiety eating disorders, dissociation, or self-harm or hatred, nor is it simply not <laughs> nor is it simply not liking your body. All or some of those things might be present for trans people, but that's not what being trans is. But you know, when I read this paragraph from Joanne and when I look at that thread by the autism mom, I can't help but feel some things. Honestly, I can't help but relate to some of these descriptions. Like, a lot. Again, what they talking about me for? Right, so I'm somebody who has a bunch of sensory discomforts which are directly triggered by having things like boobs and periods and all the array of pains and procedures and products that go along with them. Growing up, my mom would constantly tell me that I should have been a boy. <laughs> because I liked baggy clothes and climbing trees and getting dirty and I wanted to cut my hair. Something that she literally would not let me do and I had to wait until she went away and then I convinced my dad to let me do it and oh, was she not happy. Like repeatedly was I told that I should have been a boy. Another one of Michaela's favorite pastimes is climbing trees. I'm sure she should have been a boy, you know. I always picked the boy's Happy Meal toy, liked media that was traditionally male orientated, all the cliches. As I got older, I realised that there were pressures and obstacles and horrors awaiting me as I became a woman, things that didn't apply to my male classmates and I hated it. And guess what else? I knew trans people existed. I knew I could have changed my gender expression if I'd wanted. By my mid-teens, I was mixing in circles who embraced alternative culture and fashion, who were more or less accepting of queer people, if not queer themselves. Like, I'm not saying there were no societal barriers to coming out in the mid-2000s. There definitely were many. But the point is that the idea that simply being educated about gender identity Simply knowing about stuff that this will confuse the autistic kids into transing themselves, I find it ridiculous. And I tell you my background because I feel like I was a good example of the kind of autistic girl that JK Rowling is talking about, as well as being someone kind of like her in many regards, who 
was born, perhaps not 30, but 20 years later. I was a depressed, anxious, autistic, bi, fat tomboy of a kid who was, as I said, repeatedly told that I should have been born a boy. As I aged, I awaited womanhood with dread. And I've always had a lot of sensory discomfort when it comes to womanly things. But I don't wonder whether I would have transitioned. I knew that I could have if I were trans. Because being trans is not any of those things. The way you know you're trans, I think, is if you know that you're another gender and you wish to live that truth. Now you might say, well, Mika, maybe you just have a really strong and sure understanding of your own identity. And um, no. To that, I would say, lol. Absolutely the fuck do I not? It's a problem. But aside from my own experience of autism and gender and stuff, um, it's, it's just not really clear to me how people are making the link, or rather jump, between sensory processing issues and wanting to transition. Going back to our autism mom, she writes, for fuck's sake, I guarantee every single autistic kid believes they were born in the wrong body. Can you imagine what it's like having a brain which only ever briefly quiets down when you are sleeping? Can you imagine how everything in your immediate environment causes distress? Foods that neurotypical people eat have weird textures to you. Sounds that no one else notices are so loud in your head that you are constantly covering your ears. Certain lights cause panic. Clothing textures of all kinds itch so much that sometimes being naked is best option. I guarantee any child who has endured this kind of existence might generally want to believe that somehow if they were just another sex that all these problems would disappear. The lack of understanding of the autistic mind is truly staggering here. Yeah, the lack of understanding of the autistic mind truly is staggering here. Don't sign your tweets. Now, this is a description of a pretty severe case of sensory processing disorder, which remember, is something that not all autistic people have. As I've said before, I am a pretty sensitive type autistic, and no, I can't imagine everything in my immediate environment causing me distress. That sounds horrific. It sounds almost as if there are many, many things in his immediate environment which need to be changed to suit his needs. Mum? But sure, textures, foods, lights, noises, I get it, that's me. But what I don't get is how transitioning would alleviate any of it. I generally want to believe that somehow if they were just another sex that all these problems would disappear. The word somehow is doing an awful lot of work in that sentence. Autistic people who know that they're autistic tend to know what autism is. We tend to know it's brain-based. And right, so I'm absolutely no expert here, but I've been listening to trans people talking about the process of transitioning for about seven years now, and comfortable is not exactly the word that springs to mind when I think back on those stories. But come on, I'm sure you're saying, you should probably stop though because I can't hear you. We can't pretend that nobody ever got confused about themselves or their identities. That sometimes people think a thing about themselves and then later change their mind. That is a thing that happens. Sure, but if we are worried about people making decisions that they might later regret, and this is something that obviously applies to many different things, not just transitioning. But if we are worried about that, or if we're worried about vulnerable and isolated people being taken advantage of, then the thing that we do is we try to build positive and accepting communities. And how do we do that? <laughs> With acceptance, openness, non-judgment, 
by allowing people to experiment, explore, play, make mistakes, without fearing that they might lose their community. We do it with more information, more education, more advice, more ears to listen, more shoulders to cry on, more experiences and pains and joys shared. If you're worried about autistic girls wrongly thinking that they're trans boys, Joanne, then the more trans and autistic and trans autistic voices they hear, the better. And allowing them to play with their gender expression, to try on different hats in a casual, enjoyable, safe and supportive way, that's a great thing. What you don't do, Joanne, what you absolutely should not do is say, we will refuse to accept you for who you say you are until you fully commit and prove it to us by jumping through any number of arbitrary and potentially life-changing hoops. And even then, we still probably won't. Joanne. All right, I'm done with the good faith. I'd love to just be able to go, don't listen to them, they're a bunch of lying bigots. But I can't because they're also highly funded and well-organised lying bigots who have made it so that my 70-year-old dad is on the phone to me asking what gender recognition is and why is it all over the news. Any effective solutions to the problems that they say they're worried about are things which they directly oppose, like openness, acceptance, education. They're not out there trying to make autistic kids more comfortable in expressing themselves or helping them understand their bodies and autism. They're not fighting for us and our acceptance, are they? Let's have a look, shall we? Let's have a cheeky peek at what gender critical parents have to say on the matter. Oh, funny how these concerned parents seem indistinguishable from your average HAN user, innit? It's arse layers as far as the eye can see. But you also have things like mothers bemoaning the high functionality of their autistic kids. Because this means that they won't be able to gain conservatorship over them when they turn 18 and parents all over outright blaming autism for their kids thinking they're trans. Recently, gender critical groups were celebrating the case of one British mother who managed to have safeguarding from gender ideology added to her autistic child's EHCP, or Education, Health and Care Plan. This is a legally binding document containing a pathway for the education and care of kids and young adults who have special educational needs or disabilities. These are individual-centred plans which are created over time with the specific needs of the disabled person in mind and of course with input from parents. What this case effectively means is that the autistic child will be excluded from assemblies, lessons, reading sessions or anything else which might contain a reference to gender ideology. EHCPs are designed to allow schools to be more inclusive of disabled kids. And yet here we see them being used to exclude, based on the personal, bigoted beliefs of the parent. Mum's net love to see it. Gender critical parents often argue for the importance of parents continuing to get to speak for their disabled children. One parent wrote an article about how severely learning disabled women have no voice and so it's up to the gender critical movement to speak for them. Are there any groups of women less able to advocate for themselves? Are there any groups of women more in need of the voices of others? Not just family members, but all who are concerned with sex-based rights to shout from the rooftops on their behalf. 
The article repeatedly states that non-verbal and learning disabled women have no voice. I've said it before and I'll say it again, but if you think that those who need alternative means by which they can express themselves have no voice, then that's because you're not listening. They have no mental capacity. They are fully reliant on others to take decisions in their best interests. They have no voice. The most severely learning disabled women cannot speak, write or type. They lack capacity. They have no voice. Now I've talked about care facilities at length in my video on female only spaces and that is the main theme of the article. But the constant repetition of the idea that disabled people with very high care needs have no voice is an incredibly dangerous one. And honestly, so is the idea that it will always be parents who have their best interests at heart. Currently, our voice is, to all intents and purposes, our daughter's voice. This will change once she reaches 18. Our voice will still count, but in some cases as a voice to be consulted, rather than as a voice with authority. While we need so much more funding and resources and care being put into social care, and we really, really do, the fact remains that Disabled people are still much more likely to be abused by somebody they know. Parents murder their disabled children at absolutely alarming rates. Loose data suggests that in the US, autistic children in particular made up over 50% of the overall victims of filicide. Since 2012, Disability activists have come together every year on what has become known as the Disability Community Day of Mourning on March 1st. In the past five years, over 550 people with disabilities have been murdered by their parents. Every year on March the 1st, the disability community gathers across the nation to remember disabled victims of filicide. Disabled people murdered by their family members or caregivers. We see the same pattern repeating over and over again. A parent kills their disabled child. The media portrays these murders as justifiable and inevitable due to the burden of having a disabled person in the family. If the parent stands trial, they're given sympathy and comparatively lighter sentences if they are sentenced at all. The victims are disregarded, blamed for their own murder at the hands of the person they should have been able to trust the most and ultimately forgotten. And then the cycle repeats. Of course, that 550 number is probably lower than the true number. Disabled babies, children and adults die at the hands of their caregivers all over the world and will probably never know about them. I would highly recommend you go and watch Kaylin's series Inside a Cult to see how horrendously abusive many gender critical parents are to their kids, how this is celebrated and encouraged by the groups, and how doubtful or more thoughtful members are either ostracized or coerced into agreement. The contempt shown by parents towards their own children is a pretty tough thing to witness though, so content warning. These people don't care about autistic kids. They don't care for the beautiful and wonderful variety of shapes and sizes that humans naturally come in. They want conformity and segregation. They want control. They do not listen. And they do not care what harms are done by the removal of rights that people need to survive. They do not listen. All these logical arguments and statistical evidence that are presented here should really be seen as supplementary material, contextual background, if anything, because the truth behind the relationship between autism and transness is actually really easy to find. You can just ask trans autistic people. You can talk to them and listen to them, and believe them. Believe 
that they know a little bit more about their own experience and identity than anyone else. A couple of months ago, I asked for personal anecdotes from trans autistic people about how they view the relationship between their autism and their gender. The response was overwhelming. Thank you so much. There's no need for me to summarise what was said. Trans autistic people have had enough of people speaking for them. So now, just listen. I don't think autistics are more likely to be trans. Rather, we're more likely to realize we're trans because we examine social structures from the outside. And this includes gender and our relationship to it. To us, social structures can seem opaque and we spend more time than most thinking about how we fit into these norms which are impressed on us, or rather, don't fit in. Of course, part of that will be examining one's feelings about gender. I don't think holistics usually do that level of introspection. When I was young, I thought a lot of the assumptions about men and women were completely arbitrary. I would ask, why must boys be X and girls are expected to be Y? But I just get different versions of, that's just the way things are. I assumed it to be true, but autistic people are more likely to reject the social cues which heteronormativity relies on. I think that's why. I was diagnosed as autistic in the 90s when there was a lot of junk science like extreme male brain models to work through. But kids at school would call me a girl to insult me, but it didn't register as an insult. I knew I was a trans woman when I was identifying as agender and somebody tried to misgender me by calling me a woman. At high school, I thought that my beliefs were targeting me for my neurodivergency, but in hindsight, I realize now that was more because my bullies assumed I was queer and <laughs> they were right. For me, it's hard to differentiate between when I was masking my neurodivergence and my gender identity, both of which I had to from a young age. A lot of damage was done by the realization that those around me didn't think of things like I do. And of course, the ostracization which comes with that, and not having the words to describe what I was feeling, only made things worse. Sophie from Mars calls gender dysphoria gender trauma, and I agree with that, but I've also been traumatized by having to fit my neurodivergent self into the neurotypical constraints which society forces onto us. Just like coming out as trans, realizing my autism helped to relieve some of that stress. Now I know why I don't seem to function like others do. It was like a blurred image coming into focus. But there is also a wistful kind of sadness that comes with both realizations. All that time, not knowing why I was different. The bitterness over the people who might have helped but didn't. But being able to live my life as I do now, that mitigates those dark thoughts. Now I feel content in myself. I feel whole. I realised at a young age that the words man and woman have social uses rather than describing physicality. When people say be a man, they are referring to certain behaviours, not anatomy. I do not like contradictions like that. I think it removes words of their use and clarity. I also do not take social constructs as a given, so I decided to not participate. I don't believe sex is important socially. It shouldn't affect our lives outside of the doctor's office. Gender wasn't a part of my life early on as my parents never pushed me into girly stuff. But then boys started treating me differently. And as I was always one of them, I couldn't understand. Later, when I started seeing trans people online, I couldn't relate to trans medicalist descriptions. So I thought I must just be struggling to be a woman. But then I embraced cosplay and I never felt better than when I was seen as a man. The end. As an agender aero ace person, I believe that we autistic people can escape the conditioning and responsibilities of society. We're able to explore our personalities more than neurotypical people can. I embraced my transness and autism at the same time, when I stopped trying to follow the rules society set for me. Something I've noticed, gender criticals talk about trans masculine people and autistic people in very similar ways. They treat us like babies like we're completely incapable of agency or self-advocacy, even as adults. 
The infantilization is relentless, while gender criticals are out there acting like our saviors, as if they're so poor and burdened by having to protect us by making decisions on our behalf. But there is a difference, mainly surrounding reproductive rights. Gender criticals don't want autistic people having kids. It's classic eugenics. But their top priority when it comes to transmasculine people is saving breasts and uteruses for reproductive reasons. So if you're autistic, they want you sterilized. But if you're transmask, they want to turn you into a baby-making machine. If someone's both, they tend to lean toward baby making, especially if you're white. But no matter what, it's all about control. Controlling the bodies of autistic and transmask people as if we can't be trusted to have a say about our own bodies. Is there any wonder why they never listen to us? I think it's more to do with autistic people being more likely to come out. We're already on the outside in a way. But I have multiple neurodivergencies, so I experience many things differently to neurotypical people. So why wouldn't that affect attraction and gender? I feel like lots of the social structures we're expected to follow just don't make sense and nobody can explain why we have to follow these rigid expectations of gender. Like, why do only girls need to shave? Why are boy nipples and girl nipples treated differently? Autistic people already spend so much time trying to figure out a world that makes no sense to us. So to me, when it came to gender, I was just already so fed up with the structures. I've known I wasn't happy being a girl since before I had words for it. I had a desperately unhappy adolescence and identified as non-binary for a while in my late teens, early twenties in the hopes that it would be enough. It wasn't before biting the bullet half a decade ago. I don't think gender diversity is more prevalent amongst autistic folks. I think we're just more likely to realize it. Especially if you're seen by society as a girl. The level of enforcement of society's rules on you is intense. You face that both as a trans person and a neurodiverse person. The experience of the latter as a source of unhappiness and stress makes it easier to recognize the former as the same. I do also think autistic people are more likely to take action when it becomes clear. For me, it was a case of trying to live as non-binary just to see if it was enough not to be female. But it wasn't. I knew I was really a man, and once I was certain that there was no denying it, I went all in. I lived outside of society's expectations of gender my whole life, dressing and acting as I pleased, but being gendered female still infuriated me. And when I looked in the mirror, there was something missing. That something turned out to be testosterone. It was worth the additional ostracization and risk to be happier. From my own experience and speaking to others, I believe that because we already have to make our peace with constantly clashing against social norms, it's like gender is just one more thing. I actually think that the elevated rates of trans autistic people just show that trans people are a lot more common than cis society realizes. Just to function in neurotypical spaces, Autistic people have to do a lot more introspection and consideration of their thought processes and interactions. So I'm not surprised that we find out more about ourselves as we have a constant pressure to analyse ourselves. Not that this is a good thing, we shouldn't have to do so much or deal with so many pressures in order to navigate society. In an ideal world, being autistic or gender diverse would be an uninteresting fact of life. But instead, as we try to understand this difficult world, both are forced into the forefront. I just think well, autistic people aren't compatible with nonsense, arbitrary rules, which most gender enforcement is. So we're much less likely to keep an identity which is wrong for us. My experience of being trans and autistic was knowing I was different from a very young age, but not really having the words to describe it. I was always very introspective, and I noticed things about myself which indicated my autism and transness. But my mother accepted my transness more quickly, as she was kinder to trans people than she was to neurodivergent people. I can remember parts of my childhood that indicate autism, but my mother insisted against it. I think people think that being autistic and trans are both like torture or something. Like they can't fathom that someone could be both and not be a lost cause. 
Firstly, I think trans people are more likely to have mental health issues because their lives are generally worse pre-transition, so they're way more likely to be diagnosed with ASD. In particular, the reason I was diagnosed was because I was getting really depressed because of puberty. Another big reason is, as an autistic person, you need to learn how society works more explicitly. You need to think about all the facets of your identity and behavior, and this makes it easier to realize your transness. Personally, my transness was hidden for a long time. I presented as male and was depressed, but I didn't realize that I was unhappy with my gender identity. But at one point, I started engaging with trans YouTube. After one YouTuber well, socially transitions, she streamed herself watching some of her old videos and said, Oh hey, it was pretty obvious at the time. This shocked me as I had identified with her in the past, but I had considered transness for myself. So I asked myself at that point, would I rather not be a man? And my first thought was, no, of course not, I'm supposed to be one. But then I realized this was a learned thought and not a feeling. So I asked myself again, forcing me to feel first. Fuck, I said out loud. I wonder whether it's true that autistic people are more likely to be trans or if it's more probable that neurotypical people are inclined to stay in the closet. I made my peace with being treated poorly by society, so I'd need a very good reason to live my life by rules that hurt me. For me, I came into my own identity in my late 20s and discovered my neurodivergence uh, after I'd openly identified as non-binary after I came out and started shifting the way I present to the world. For me, the way that masculinity was, the way that I had performed masculinity was far, far more identifiable as following the kind of janky social scripts of autism. Now looking back on it in, in hindsight, the way that I tried to be a man um, was to synthesize pop culture and my peers poorly without that whatever it is that I and many autistic people miss in how we are socialized to perform our gender. So partly for me, reclaiming those elements of my masculinity and my non-binary identity alongside my elements of femininity and feminine presentation that's the that's the crux that's where it happens that's how my autism and my gender interact my personal opinion again youtuber can't help it but my opinion which seems to be corroborated not only by the statistical evidence but also by the testimonies of every trans person I've spoken to about this, but it's that autistic people are not more likely to be LGBTQ plus than the general population. Rather, that several factors of the autistic experience in a neurotypical society leads to us doing a lot of introspection, a lot more questioning of our identity and our place in the world as well as questioning the arbitrary rules and structures that go along with it. And so yes, we are simply just more likely to realise our identity as LGBTQ+. What do you think? When I was thinking about my own identity and how I express myself through aesthetics and interests, I realised that at some point during my teens, I figured out that no matter what I did, I wasn't going to fit in. I was going to be bullied, laughed at, left out, misunderstood. And there was this kind of, well, fuck it moment when I decided that I might as well just live and act and dress as I want. I was lucky, of course, that I had that freedom, but I think that many autistic people out there relate to this. In fact, the likes on my tweet saying exactly that show that many people do relate to that. 
Gender critical people want us to think of trans people as either predatory dangers or misguided and weak-willed victims who need to be saved from themselves. What's that thing about fascists and how they always present their victims as ultimately strong and weak at the same time? I digress. They don't want you to listen to trans people. They don't want you to trust or believe them. And they will use their ableist assumptions about autistic people to further this narrative. And because we live in an ableist world, it works. I have deliberately stayed away from the words gender dysphoria in this script, and if you'd like to learn why, I recommend watching this video by Abigail Thorne, Philosophy Tube, um, particularly chapter 9, which starts at the around the one hour mark, in which she illustrates the category errors involved in gender dysphoria diagnosis. That's not to say that every trans person out there fully agrees with Abigail on this, but it's at least a contentious term. And so I just don't think it's my place to go throwing around a term that is being discussed and debated by trans people. But I will say that the idea that to be trans is to have a mental health or a mood disorder, which can be treated in other ways, is to pathologize the natural variety of human beings. A variety which has existed since time immemorial, as well as being a way to delegitimize trans voices in an ableist world. Neurodiversity advocates such as myself are working to depathologize difference. In the autistic community, we typically tend to prefer ID first language as opposed to person first language. So that means we prefer being called autistic people rather than people with autism. Because autism isn't something that I have. It's a word that describes my neurology. Autistic is an adjective which describes the kind of person I am. The only treatment for autistic suffering is environmental change. To create a society which is accepting and supportive of us. To allow us to be ourselves without ridicule, judgement, violence or worse. Just as the main way of treating trans suffering is to allow trans people to live their lives as themselves and to support them in this. From my years of listening to trans people, if I was to summarise the needs and desires I've heard expressed in one sentence, it would be, please let us live our lives in peace and dignity. I'm not sure how to conclude this video. As I wrote this paragraph of the script, the news of the murder of Brianna Jai was just coming out. A 16 year old trans girl just starting her life, taken in the most horrendous way and as well the horrendous abhorrent responses by so many gender criticals which do not bear repeating here. So I think I'll just remind you that this video comes with a resources document linked in the description, full of information, resources, education, art, creativity, from wonderful trans creators and educators. Go there, please. You'll also find similar documents linked below my other videos on gender criticals. See, I usually do some kind of rousing and inspirational paragraph at the end of my videos, but this time I think I'll just settle for this. Do not put up with debates over people's right to exist. Do not heed the words of those who would control the lives of others. Listen to us. Listen to autistic people. Listen to trans people. We are the experts of our own experience. And nobody else. 
first I need to thank the sensitivity readers for taking the time and sending me such thoughtful feedback. Thank you so much. Special thanks as well to all the autistic trans people who trusted me with their stories. I hope I did the topic justice. Of course, I thank my wonderful patrons, the best and coolest people in the whole wide world. It would really help me out if you considered joining them. Boba would appreciate it too. This month, my channel celebrates its three year anniversary. So, you know, if you want to do something to celebrate, the link's right there. But most of all, thank you to you. Yes, you. For watching till the end. Remember to like and comment and share this video with anyone who might need it. Okay. I love you. Bye.